Namaste. So, last time we talked a little bit about meditation on the void. Just an introduction. Now today I want to get a little more into it. And what is meditation on the void, really? It's a device. It has to be a device because <laughs> if you are really in the void, there's no such thing as meditation. Meditation means a subject, I, contemplating an object. But <laughs> in the void, there is no subject and no object. Or you could say there is only the subject. Though there is no such thing as meditation. And not only that, one who is really in the void is devoid of the knowledge of the void or of anything else either. Because again, there's no subject object. And to have knowledge, there has to be duality. So really when we're saying meditation on the void, it's equivalent to saying being Brahman. Now, of course, according to the Upanishads and the uh, teachings of Shankaracharya, there is nothing but Brahman. Only Brahman exists. Everything else is just an appearance. Uh, just a a maya, an illusion, a delusion. And because of that, we already are Brahman. There's nothing else to be. But the illusion is that we become this and that. See, becoming means a change, a transformation. Uh, I always have to laugh when I hear these New Age types talking about transformation as if it's something wonderful. No, transformation is the illusion. Return to our original state is enlightenment. So the purpose of meditation on the void as a device is to get us to contemplate all these things. And as soon as we do, we see that actually <laughs> we're already in the void. <laughs> we are the void. We are pure awareness, pure being. No change, no thinking, no becoming, no subject-object duality. Uh, it's always been that way and it's always going to be that way. That's just the way it is. So last time <laughs> we introduced a beautiful verse by the Buddha. Now I want to explain it a little bit more because it uses some terminology that's kind of specialized. Tatrapahang bhikkave neva agating vadami Nagating na titing na chuting na upapating. Apatitang apavatang aramararam evatang. Es ev anto dukasa. I say, monks, there is neither a coming nor a going, nor a standing nor a passing away, nor being reborn that state which is unestablished, non-continuing, and objectless, is itself the end of suffering. So, of course, the end of suffering is an epithet for nirvana, nirvana, the ultimate enlightenment, Buddhahood. Uh, and he says, in that state, there is neither a coming nor a going. Coming and going means change, doesn't it? 
First of all, you have to have a location, a here. And then you come to that location. And going means there has to be another location, a there. And then you move from this location to that location. That's going. But he's saying in Vrindavan, I mean, sorry, in Nibbana, <laughs> funny the similarity between those words, there is no coming and going. Why? No place to come from. No place to go to. There's no space. No dimension. No time. No here and there. No movement. No change. No coming and going. See? Because the void is everywhere. It's everything. It penetrates everywhere. There's no question of going into the void or coming out of the void. There's no question of going to Nirvana. And there's no question of coming out of Nirvana. Nirvana is always there. It's our natural state. It is the way it is. And to think anything otherwise is illusion, is unenlightenment. See, what does Nibbana mean, actually? The word comes from an old Sanskrit term that refers to the going out of a fire. When a fire is burning dependent on some fuel, and that fuel is, is exhausted, the fire goes out. Well, where does it go? <laughs> It doesn't go anywhere. The conditions that cause it change. They disappear. There's no more nutriment, no more fuel. So the fire simply disappears. It's gone. Why? Because the conditions that cause it are gone. Where did they go? No place. There's no place to go. So Nibbana is the same phenomenon, the going out, the extinguishing of conditioned consciousness. So there's neither coming nor going, nor standing nor passing away. Well, where is there to stand? See, if there's no location, how can you stand? Or how can you pass away or be reborn? If there's no location, if there's no place. See, what is this body? Uh -huh. What is reborn, actually? is only the body. What comes and goes, what stands and passes away, what is reborn is nothing but the body. And this is a natural sequence. It happens just like the passing of the seasons, spring, summer, fall, winter, and again spring. So these are phenomena, and they're dependent on causes. And when those causes change, the phenomena changes. Just like the moon. We just had a beautiful full moon. When the moon reaches its maximum fullness, then it immediately begins to wane until it becomes a narrow crescent and then it disappears at new moon. And then again, it begins to grow until it becomes full. So nobody is going to lament the passing away of the moon at new moon <laughs> because we know, oh, after this, it's going to come back and become full again. So in the same way, nobody laments or should lament the passing of the body. Because, again, bodies are coming, dependent on some cause. The parents' conjugation. Uh, and then their cause is their parents, the grandparents, and then the great-grandparents, and so on. So because of all these causes, this body is here. And it remains for some time. It stands. 
and then it passes away. It's no big deal. Like we were talking about last time, the body is simply an abstract concept that refers to a combination or aggregation of elements. And so we shouldn't be upset. We shouldn't be concerned. We shouldn't be worried about this body. The body is going to come and go whether we worry about it or not. So this is simply a natural phenomenon. And then what does he say? He says something very, very profound. That state which is unestablished. Hmm? What's the word? Apatitam. Apatitam. Not established on anything. So whenever you have a being or a becoming, it is established on something. It has a cause. It has a context. And because of that, when the cause changes, the effect also changes. When the context changes, then the result changes. The content changes. So we have the body because of a cause, the parent's conjugation. When that cause is used up, huh? the effect of that cause is, is burned up, the fuel like the fuel of a fire, then the body naturally goes away. Because it's established on a cause. In the same way the body is established in a context, an environment with food and so forth. The body needs certain nutriments, foods, Regular food, water, air, rest, shelter, clothing, and so on. And if those uh, disappear or change beyond certain limits, then that will also make the body go away. So there's nothing to be concerned about unless one is <laughs> attached to this state of being established, see, thinking that it's real. It's not real. It's conditional only. So then what is unestablished? Well, let's take a look at consciousness. Consciousness is like an, like an arm, like a, like a limb for grasping things. Grasping different objects and bringing them into attention. So when my consciousness, for example, is aware of the body, the different senses of the body, sight, hearing, smell, taste, touch, and the mind. I'm using my consciousness to grasp these different objects and bring them closer so that I can perceive them. So the problem is conditioned consciousness is established. What's the word? Pavitam. Pavitam. It's established on something. It's established on the body, usually. And that's absurd. That's like having an arm with a hand at both ends. <laughs> uh -huh. The hand is used to grasp objects, right? So the hand at one end tries to grasp the object and establish itself on it, like the body, for example. And then the hand on the other end is used in an ordinary way to grasp objects. But the body is not a stable object. The body passes away depending on other causes. So the consciousness that's established on the body is unstable. And actually, the body is changing all the time. You wake up in the morning, maybe we feel tired, sleepy. Then we have some coffee, and we get all wake up, <laughs> go run around, do some exercise or something. And then it gets hot, uh, and maybe it rains, and then it gets cold. Some days we're happy, some days we're sad. 
all dependent on various causes. So here's the poor consciousness is trying to grasp this body to establish itself, but the body is constantly changing. It's like an ocean with full of waves of change. So how can the consciousness be steady, peaceful? Huh? Etam santam, etam panitam. This is peaceful. This Nibbana is peaceful, but conditioned consciousness is not peaceful because it can't be established on anything peaceful. The only way to have a peaceful consciousness is it for, to be unestablished. Now, this is the Buddha's way of saying established on the void. And actually, if we look into it a little bit, we find consciousness is always established in the void. We only think that we are establishing it on the body or the senses or the mind. That's the illusion. So when we disabuse ourselves of the illusion, of the ignorance, of thinking that consciousness has to be established on some object, then it becomes established in the void naturally, uh, simply by not establishing it anywhere else because it's already established on the void. The void is nothing but pure consciousness, pure awareness, actually, uh, because the next word he uses is objectless. What is it? Anaramaranam, objectless. So consciousness without an object is awareness. In the void, there's nothing to be aware of. There's no object. There's only the subject itself. So this is the basis of consciousness. Uh, this is the actual establishment of consciousness in the void. And then it, it grows an arm and a hand, so to speak, to grasp different objects in the world. So one's consciousness should be established in the void. And actually, it really is. It already is. But in conditioned consciousness, we don't realize that. We think it's established on the body or the mind or the senses. Or some idea or set of beliefs or something, something made. Sankara. Something fabricated. And that is the illusion, that is the maya, that is unenlightenment. That's why we suffer. Because to have, a, uh, to have an established consciousness based on the body is to have always unstable, changing conditions. It's, it's a, a suffering. The consciousness is never the same. It's not stable. We can't count on it. So this is a cause of suffering. So when we give up trying to establish the consciousness on something else, some other object, then it naturally goes back to its default state of being established in the void. So that's the meaning of meditation on the void. Dropping all these other objects and trying to establish consciousness on them and just allowing it to come back into its normal, natural state. And that's Nibbana, that's the end of suffering. Aum Tatsat. Aum Harihi Aum.